Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tanaka Mutakwa, and I work as the VP of Engineering at a startup called Names and Faces. Uh, we have a distributed team uh, with people in the States, some people in the UK, but most of our dev team is based in Cape Town. Names and Faces, we make a simple, fast, visual employee directory that allows you to identify who's who at your company and where they fit in. Common use case for this is when you just started at a new company, a lot of people introduce themselves to you on their first few days. When you come back to the office the next day, you've probably forgotten everyone's name, and you're embarrassed to ask them again what their name is. If your company uses names and faces, you can take out the app, and because it's visual, you can identify people easily from their face so you can recall their names. But that's just like one example use case. There are plenty of other use cases at companies that adopt names and faces. It is a mobile app, and we also have a web app. And if you want to hear more about names and faces, I'm happy to chat to you after the, the talk. And also, you can download the app from the App Store or the Play Store. And you can just, after you download it, it will allow you to try a demo. So you have a demo company you can have a look at. At Names and Faces, I work as a VP of Engineering. So my day-to-day -day role falls into these four areas. On the technology side, it's working with the dev team to see if we're using the right technology stack. We're building software that's of a good quality and we're delivering at the right time. People and culture, from the people side, I work with all the developers, so they report directly into me and it's helping them develop their careers and grow and see where they want to get to. And also, it's on the culture side, it's making sure everyone's happy within the team, everyone's working well together, and there aren't any conflicts between people. The process side is obviously how the team works, how we work together day to day, uh, and the different methodologies we use. So I facilitate most of the team processes, so like daily stand-up, the team retrospectives, the reviews, and demos. And then on the product side, it's working with the rest of the company, so people in different departments, the client team, the marketing team, the design team, CTO, CEO, product manager, to decide whether we're building the right thing for our clients and whether the product is moving in the right path. Some of you now, or most of you probably have heard this story before about two managers who are seated having a massive debate about employee training. The one manager is arguing that we shouldn't send people for training because if we do, what if they come back and then they leave the company? To which the other manager replies, what if we don't send them for training and they stay at the company? <laughs> I'm going to be talking about that today. My topic is titled Scaling People, Leveling Up Software Engineers. Often when we talk about scale, we often talk about tools and technologies that companies apply and approaches they make from the technical side when they're feeling the pressure as customers increase and they need to figure out how to handle it. So a lot of the things people will talk about are how they apply technologies to solve those problems. But we hardly ever talk about the people, the people who are actually writing these tools and that are using these technologies. Because as a company is scaling, the people also need to grow so that they're able to better handle the challenges that the company is facing. So today I'd like to share a couple of approaches that a company can use to basically help grow their software engineers and help them level up as the company is scaling. When I'm speaking, I'm gonna speak from the side of a tech leadership role. So if you are in a tech leadership role or a position of influence at your company, these different approaches are the things you can use to grow the software engineers at your company. However, if you aren't in a tech, in a tech leadership role, it doesn't matter, you can listen to the approaches as approaches you could use yourself to grow your career, or you can introduce at your company and help motivate to be added to your company. So yeah, let's get right into it. The very first important approach is sitting down with all your software engineers individually and figuring out what their short-term, medium-term, and long-term goals are for their career. Everyone is very different. Everyone works at your company for a different reason. Everyone's probably got a different path they want to take their career. So it's important to identify each person's different individual short-term, medium-term, and long-term goals. And once you have this, you can, you, you're better able to figure out where someone's trying to go and better able to try plan for where they should go. 
So for example, if I look at myself, like many years back when I just started diving, probably straight out of uni, um, my short-term goals at the time were probably to just have a good understanding of the, of the technologies we we're using at the company I worked at. So basically a lot more on the technical side, trying to understand the programming languages and the architecture. And on the medium term, I always knew I wanted to be in some form of leadership role. So that was like, at some point I want to be maybe a manager of a couple of developers and help them, help mentor them and grow their careers. And then on the longer term, I was looking at possibly I would either be in a VP of engineering role or a CTO role, or perhaps like a CEO of a company or something like that. So that's what you'd sort of see someone setting as their different goals. It's like some are very close to what I am at right now. Some I could get to in a couple of years. Some I need like nine to 10 years, which sort of I've been working for. Once you've set the short term, medium term and long term goals, you want to have an effective growth plan based on those goals. So how do you actually get to those goals? If you look at the goals being the what, then the effective growth plan is the how. And that means like you look at someone's goal, you look at what are the different approaches we can take to get there, and then you put timelines on how to get to those goals. So this is the plan that actually makes them happen. And closely tied to that plan that makes them happen is you want your engineers to have regular check-ins with their manager. In, in the, and in these check-ins, you want them to be kept accountable for the goals they're trying to go for. So in these check-ins, it's just the engineer sitting down with the manager, and they're looking at, well, when we sit down and, and set your goals, this is what you wanted. We set your plan, this is what we said we we're gonna do. So where are you with what you're trying to achieve? Is there anything you need help with? And that's where the managers can then help and like nudge them with like, the right resources to look at, or point out people that can help them with getting there. This part of like setting your goals is not and, and aiming to achieve them is not always straightforward. Sometimes maybe along the way you achieve some of them very quickly or some of them you decide to change as you go along. So these regular check-ins are a place for adjusting where you're heading to and, um, and making sure you're now going the direction you want to go. I prefer these check-ins on a personal level to happen very frequently. So I have check-ins every week for 30 minutes with each developer to make sure there isn't too big a gap between the last time we try to keep each other accountable to the next time. Also, the check-ins are a good place to check on the health of the person, how are they doing at the company, do they have any issues they're facing, and the more frequent you have them, the better. And then one last thing on check-ins is, from a tech leadership side, they're usually the first thing you drop when you're really under pressure with a lot of other things that are happening at the company. But then that sends out a message that you consider the check-ins as the least, least, least important thing on your, on your list of things to do, which means your people become the least important thing. So if you can, this should be the last thing you cancel or you try reschedule. Everything else should they then take a secondary role to this. On the goals that you initially set at the beginning, you should try make sure you have a couple of stretch goals for your for your software engineers. It's very easy to fall into either two buckets. One bucket is you set goals that you can definitely achieve and you just go out there and do them. There isn't much learning there. And the other side is you set very, very ambitious goals that are actually impossible to achieve and it can be overwhelming and frustrating and the process doesn't make sense. So while it's okay to have some goals that someone knows they'll achieve and they, they need to read like a couple of books and learn some stuff, it's also important to give them a couple of challenging ones where once something they think is impossible, but then once they've achieved it, they actually see the gap in where they were and how much they've learned. That's actually the mark of growth. And then also once you know where someone's trying to go, you can probably point them with resources that can help their learning journey along that, grow, that goal they're aiming for. So by resources, I mean things like books, podcasts, newsletters, blogs, that people can look at and are directed towards what your goal is. So if, for example, my goal is to become very proficient in Ruby on Rails, then as a manager, you could look at what are the books that are well known in that area. If you've been a Ruby on Rails developer, you probably went through that journey before and you know which books you preferred to learn from, and you can point those books to the person all podcasts, all courses that are, com that are quite common. 
You can look back at these resources in the check-ins that I mentioned earlier, when you're keeping the person accountable. But also you can discuss, if someone's reading a book that you know about, you can discuss how are things going in that book, what are you learning, what's challenging about the book, so you can gauge if someone is growing and is actually understanding what, what, what they are learning from the resources you've, you've sort of given them. And then this next approach is team learning sessions. So basically team learning sessions, if you look at every team, every individual probably has something they know more than everyone else in the team. And what team learning sessions are is basically a session that the whole team gets into a room and one person in the team drives a learning session where they teach everyone else about something that they know more about than, than everyone. So they're more competent in a particular area than everyone else in the team. It's almost like a classroom setting where the person who's driving the, the lesson is, a, is like a lecturer and everyone else is a student. At Names and Faces, we introduced team learning sessions towards the end of last year, and we've been doing them on a two-weekly basis. The way we do ours is basically in the context of a problem we're about to solve in the near future. So for example, we're gonna be building our new mobile app very soon. We've hired a couple of people who've never done mobile apps before. So we've got one guy who's very, very strong at mobile development. So he's been running the mobile development sessions, getting everyone up to speed. So by the time we get to building the mobile app in about a month's time, everyone's got good context and an idea of what to do. So that's also like a way you can, you can approach it, which is what problems are we going to solve? What knowledge do we need? Someone in the team has it. Can they upskill everyone and get them up to the same level of competence? But yeah, it can also be just about generally any, anything else. It doesn't have to be that approach. It's just something we found works. And it's great to always rotate so that everyone gets an opportunity to teach and everyone gets to learn from everyone else. My slides aren't moving. Cool. Pay programming. So you wanna encourage pair programming between your engineers. The learning sessions that I mentioned just before the slide, the goal of a learning session is direct. We want to increase everyone's competence in whatever the one person's driving the session, lesson is about. But with pair programming, usually the goal is to solve a problem, to build a feature or to fix a bug. So the, the lesson from pair programming, the goal is actually not to increase competence but it's a side effect that normally happens. When people pair program, there is always some learning between the two people. You either learn how someone thinks about solving problems, how someone designs a solution, or different libraries that they use. Sometimes it's even simple things like shortcuts that they use in their ID that you never knew existed and you could actually end up using. So it's worth it encouraging people to pair program. It also builds trust between the team members, and especially when it comes to scaling companies, a big problem that usually happens is alignment and people like working in a consistent way and pair programming will help with this. So it's worth encouraging. Some companies do it all the time, like they write all their code, people have to be pairing. Some companies never do it. I found at least in most places I've worked, there's like a balance. Some tasks work well for pairing, some are not really necessary. But it's up to you to come with an approach on how you wanna split this. And then this next approach is not something I would say is for everyone, but it's worth suggesting for people to try if they're interested, for your engineers to try. So the idea here is to encourage people to contribute to open source projects and be active in the open source community. When you work at a company and you're working in the same code base every day to day, you kind of, you kind of get stuck to the similar patterns of how people work there. The code is written in the same way. You've been working for a long time with the same team, so you now know how people think and how people address things. If you exit that and start working in another code base, such as an open source code base, things are completely different there because it's like everyone else from the rest of the world working on it. You may learn interesting things that you can bring back into your company. Um, you also learn a lot about how an open source project is structured. How do people contribute to it? Are requests, are pull requests approved and reviewed in the open source world? And quite a common thing that happens as companies scale and grow, especially if they do very well, is they actually open source their own software or libraries that they write. So if you end up getting into that phase where you're starting to do that, it's really 
beneficial if you have people who actually understand and have been working in the open source space and can bring that knowledge to your company. And similarly to the previous concept, which is you don't, I, you don't, I didn't mention why I said you don't have to, not everyone, it's not for everyone. The reason was usually when you're contributing to open source software in the early stages and stuff, it's actually outside of your co-working hours because then at work you're building the features for the company and everything. So it's not like everyone has the time and is, is able to actually contribute to open source software outside of work. If they want to spend time with their family, that's fine. That's, fine. that's a higher priority than the whole open source thing. And in a similar way, the, the next approach which I'm going to share, which is encouraging people to do side projects or hobby projects at home, Again, if someone is too busy by the time they get home because side projects, are, as in their nature, are outside of work, then it's worth encouraging, but then if someone's not capable, it's not supposed to be a forced thing. But again, side projects do, uh, do come with an advantage, which is you could either be building something that you're actually trying to solve at home and you're trying to automate something or something like that and you use maybe the same technology you use at work but then you apply it differently because now you're working outside of a production code base and you're trying different fancy things. Or you could actually be working in a completely different language or trying out to learn a different paradigm when you're building your side projects, which increases your knowledge and keeps you open-minded. Sometimes actually learning things from a different language or a different paradigm can translate back to what you're working at in your normal company day to day. But also, the other interesting thing is, as companies again scale and grow, they tend to sometimes not use the same technology all the time because it's not the same tool that works for every job. So they start exploring other technologies. And it's great if you've got engineers who are exposed to other technologies that they've been playing around with at home, even though maybe it's not production. But then once you start using that technology, then someone, everyone, people have knowledge about it. When I started working, I used to work in C-Sharp and ASP.NET. I actually started doing side projects with a friend and we were working with Ruby on Rails. A couple of years later, I actually went for an interview at another company which I ended up moving to and they were using Ruby on Rails. So they were pretty much confident that I was able to come in and join and be immediately productive because actually of a language I'd been learning on the side. I was also confident and less overwhelmed when I went into the company about learning a whole new technology or trying to figure out a new company because of side projects. So they are beneficial and you will definitely grow for them. And then there's things like this, right? We're at a conference now, there's meetups. The approach here is encouraging your engineers to be involved and to attend conferences and meetups and be involved in the tech community in their city or country. We are all learning a lot from all the talks that are happening at these, at these conferences and meetups, so there is already that knowledge gained. But also you gain a lot from just chatting with people and about what they do and learning about the problems they are solving. And sometimes you'd be surprised if you have a complex problem you're dealing with at work now and you meet a couple of people here, chat with them, and possibly they've dealt with that same problem in a previous company a couple of months ago or a year ago and can nudge you in the right direction and possibly actually help you solve your problem. There is another interesting side effect which is not really related to growth about all these conferences and stuff related to scale. As a company is scaling, chances are you're trying to grow your team. At these meetups and conferences, you're meeting up with people and if you're building up these contacts and people are interested in the challenges your company is solving, you never know you could end up working with these same people in the future. So there is a plug for hiring anyway. I use this slide often in talks that I, that I presented. It's often interesting to see people's eyes light up when they see this slide. <laughs> but uh, the approach here is, as a company, you need to, if you can, if the financials allow, you need to create a training budget for your employees. This is like an annual budget that allows people to, to use, that allows your employees to use it whenever they need to purchase learning resources. So those learning resources I spoke about earlier, books, like if, they are, if, if it's like a paid for course online, if they can use the budget that comes from the company, it shows how important the company prioritizes learning. Sometimes people feel they can't actually spend all their money on learning and then they feel held back because they have other higher priorities at home financially. 
But if, you're, if a company is financially able to provide a training budget, then you don't have to hold your people's learning. And you show that you, you focus on, on learning and it's important to you by having a budget for it. A lot of tech companies are doing this, so it's good to see that the industry is moving well towards this. You will find tra a training budget of some sort as a perk, which is good. And finally, the last approach, which I think is actually the most important, at least in my opinion, is helping your engineers grow and encouraging them to grow their communication skills. And from communication, this is both written and verbal, so spoken communication. As companies scale and grow, again, I mentioned alignment becomes a big problem. So communication needs to, be, needs to have increase, and it needs to be good communication, whether it's written or spoken. When people are speaking between their teams, because these teams have grown, so there's probably plenty of teams, the message needs to be very clear, and the direction we're trying to go needs to be clear. When engineers are speaking to business people, if they're talking about a complex problem, they need to be able to simplify it and explain what value it adds to the business in a very clear way. It's the last thing, and it's the thing that's mostly overlooked. A lot of engineers are pushed into learning more about technology and all the techno technical tools and basically how we interact with the machine. But how we interact with other humans is really overlooked. You can build the greatest thing ever, but if you can't really sell it or communicate to someone what it does, then doesn't, there's no point. So how do you grow communication skills? So I'll start with written. If someone's really up for it, encourage them to start a blog of their own, whether they're gonna write about tech or they're gonna write about something they're interested in outside of tech, that's fine. At least they're writing something and pushing out a message to the public. They'll start learning about how to make that message better and make it clearer. If you have an internal blog, maybe it's less, it's less of a public thing, but it's written internally. But again, as companies scale and grow, there's gonna be lots of documentation that's gonna to need to be done internally. Your GitHub repos need to have detail on how to set a project up when someone pulls it down. A lot of new people join companies, so there's probably some documentation on like how things work here and stuff like that, that engineers actually need to write. You wanna encourage your engineers to be the ones who write this, these documents. But you also want to give them feedback when they've written the documents. How could they have improved that writing? How can you make this document better? So you're slowly making people better at their writing. On the speaking side, again, you can go public. So if someone is interested, encourage them to speak at conferences, encourage them to speak at meetups. They're exposing themselves to having to prepare something and articulate a message in a very nice way. But also internally, if they don't really want to go public, there's lots of opportunities for you to increase your public speaking or communicate better. There's a lot of demos that we do internally when you've written your software. You either demo to other teams or you're demoing with, uh, to the business. So get your engineers to actually be proud of the work they've done and demo it to the business. Allow everyone that opportunity. Don't just hand it over to the product managers to do the demos. Allow the engineers to actually showcase their work. And again, give them feedback after they've demoed. Allow them to prepare, and if the demo's gone okay and there's room for improvement, suggest to them how they can improve their communication in a later time. So, in summary, these are basically the approaches I've shared on how you can help improve and grow your engineers. You wanna set short, medium, and long-term goals for them. After setting those goals, you wanna have an effective growth plan to achieve those goals. Make sure the engineers are having a regular one-to-one -one check ins ideally weekly with their manager to keep them accountable for this plan. Some of those goals should be stretch goals so that they're always feeling like they're learning and they're pushing themselves to the next level. Share resources with them, books, courses, podcasts, blogs, newsletters, that help them learn and achieve their goals. Set up some team learning sessions so that as a team, people help grow each other. Encourage pair programming with other team members. Encourage people to contribute to open source projects and work on side projects if they can. 
have a culture that allows people to attend meetups and conferences and be involved in the community so that they can learn at those meetups and conferences and also interact with other engineers outside the company. If the finances of a company allow, have a training budget to show that your company prioritizes learning. And the most important one, improve the communication of your engineers, written and spoken. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we often talk about the technologies and tools and approaches we used when we were scaling a company and we ran into like problems. All the war stories you hear about, we're getting a million requests coming in a second and this is what I did, I spun up like hundreds of servers and everything and all that. Everyone like listens to those stories and yes, they're cool. But no one, we should also talk about as our company scaled and grew, look at all these people that developed. Look at that person who came in as a grad and look how much they, how well they're doing now. Because people are also important. I read this a couple of years ago and it always stuck with me. Imagine you get to the end of your career and you say, here are all of the people I developed, I coached, I inspired, I built, I made stronger, and I made better humans. People development is fulfilling and it is important. So if we get back to those managers sitting and still having their debate today, should we send people for employee training and possibly they leave us? Maybe that is okay. People grow, they make their contribution, they go to the next place. It's still an achievement that someone's actually grown at your company. And most of the time when someone's actually grown at your company, they become an ambassador for you for the rest of their life. They will always point people back to say, oh, if you actually want to learn and grow, go to that place. That's where I got this far. So it shouldn't even be a question anymore. It should be a guarantee that you want to help train your people and grow them. I've got one plug in my slides. At the end of last year, myself and two other guys started a tech leadership meetup in Cape Town. The goal of the meetup is to bring up people who are interested in tech leadership and chat, build up a community where we chat about different topics around tech leadership. And the hope is that if we build up the leaders in the tech companies, then most of the tech companies in the industry also become better places to work. The meetup is open to people who've been serving long time in tech leadership roles, people who've just been made tech leaders, or people who are interested in becoming tech leaders in the future. We meet once a month on the first Tuesday of the month, so we had one this week actually. So if you're interested in that, you can follow our meetup page, find us on meetup.com, on on meetup and next time we create an event, you'll be notified and you can RSVP if you're interested. A topic like the one I've actually spoken about today would be something you would find at the meetup talks. That's it for me. Again, my name is Tanaka Mutakwa. <laughs> Work at Names and Faces. And I occasionally blog on mutakwa.com about life, running, and tech. So if you're interested, you can have a read. Thank you. All right. Any questions? Okay. Hi, Tanaka. One thing I'd kind of interested in hearing. Um, so we, we, there's a, a, a growing trend to get a lot of people into tech, right? And a lot of the people that are learning to code right now are just in it to get paid because, you know, we live in the country that we live in and like people are trying to get paid. So now you've got this person who knows nothing besides the Java and C Sharp that they've been taught at the boot camp and they are at your company and they really don't know much about the space that they've just walked into. And you're like, okay, let's set short, medium, and long-term goals. But like the one goal that they have is to just get paid. So the real question that I have is, does it then become your responsibility, you know, to shape them into a person who is not just here to get paid, but like they, they also view that software development or building the things that you build is like a career or even a lifestyle if you like super into it. Um, 
does, that, does it become your responsibility or do you leave them to their own devices? Like what, is, what would you recommend as an ideal approach to like, because there's a lot of them coming and like, I'm, I'm really <laughs> curious about it. Yeah, interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> so, not to say I am like that, but I think there's nothing wrong with if money is your motivation. But then, your short, if, you want, if your money is your motivation, then probably your long-term goal is to earn more and more of it. And how are you going to earn more and more of money? Your skills need to, need to improve so that you can be paid at the level that allows you to earn that an increased amount of money, right? So either way, you're still going to be leveling up the engineer skills. It's a way to tie to say, okay, if you're saying you want to be a CTO or something at some point and earn a ridiculous salary, for you to get to CTO, these are the things you need to do to get there. But it is tricky with the money thing. What I would also say is perhaps I would encourage people who are doing boot camps and stuff to try if they can. Actually do like an internship for like a month or something just to get a feel of what they're getting themselves into. Because it shouldn't just be about, oh, I heard if you code, you're going to make a lot of money. But I actually don't know what happens when you're actually in the company and what work is like, what that industry is about. Um, and then the one last thing I just thought of when you were asking your question, when you kept saying, is it your responsibility? I do think part of being a manager should not just end on, I, I come in and I check what your work is. I check the quality of your work. It also just helps developing a person in general. If a person needs to develop their professionalism even, you can be part of that and help grow the person. So some people, yes, may not allow you to go that far, but the regular weekly check-ins help you build trust with people to the point, a lot of the time, some of the check-ins I have, the first 15 minutes we're talking about something else, like how was the weekend, what was happening and stuff. We're building trust, we're almost, almost like you're becoming friends. And once you're that close to someone, then it's easier to like nudge them in the right directions of where, you are not, where they should be heading. So it is part of your responsibility, but I do think it's very hard to be successful if your only motivation is money and, there's no, and you actually don't have an interest in any field, in that particular field you're in. It's hard for you to advance. People will be faster and will, be, will get ahead of you if they are interested in that field, they're excited about it, and they're also motivated by money. Great. Over here. Hi there. Um, thanks for a great talk. So I'm part of a company where our tech team's quite small in relation to the larger company. And as I think tends to happen in a lot of places, we, we are the scapegoat for most things that go wrong. It's always <laughs> the tech. <laughs> and uh, all of these techniques, we've got teach the teams, we've got stand-ups. I flip and love my team. We're very close. Uh, we support each other a lot. Um, how do you get that across to the broader company? So the, the approach I've sort of adopted is lead by example, um, because I did try to sort of roll it out to the larger company, but it kind of didn't, it wasn't received so well. I don't know if you have any suggestions or anything you could add there. Um. In other places I've worked where scenarios like that have happened, the issue has been the, the other departments, the non-tech departments, not understanding how tech works. So part of that was how do you bring them closer to what we're doing and the issues we run into? Why can't I give you something in three days that's supposed to take three months to build you want it in three days? Like, are we not working? Um, so part of it is bringing them, approaches that have been tried is actually bring them into the day-to-day -day process. So could some of the business people attend your stand-ups? Just have a listen in and yeah, like what, what are these people talking about? What's happening? Um, even some of your other meetings like planning and uh, if you do grooming sessions of what, what work is coming up, why is my work not getting added to the next sprint? because there's probably higher priority items that, are, that have been taken by the team. 
Um, and then also the other part, which is demoing your work and building that relationship with the business. When you demo it directly to them and you are proud of the work you've done, allowing them to ask questions. So it's all, it seems, it's, it's all about relationship building, but helping the people understand more of how the tech team is working. Because it's really ever that the tech team is not working. It's really ever that we're slacking. It's just a misunderstanding thing. And also, I remember reading somewhere about, you know an organization is starting to get broken when, when tech says, speaks about the business as them. But you're the same company. So why is it them? So it's already like things like that. You want, you want it to still be like a, a shared effort and try not break that, uh, that relationship. Okay. Yeah. Still over here. Um, when adding new members to your team, how do you do effective onboarding to shorten the time of onboarding until they become productive? So I actually did a talk about this last year at Ruby Fusa, which I can share a link with you too. Because <laughs> 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 it was about 45 minutes of these of topics around uh, how someone is effectively onboarded. So again, things like pair programming as soon as they come in, uh, some prepared documentation on what our tools are um, and, and what they need to learn, what resources they need, especially if it's someone who's from a different technology background, like what tools they need to learn um, where, and where as soon as they come in and constant check-ins with someone on where are you, how are things going, are you getting used to the company, onboarding them also on the domain of the business, like apart from just the technical side. Um, so yeah, so I'm happy to chat about like that whole that whole talk and share it with you after. We'll tweet because it's actually a whole topic in itself. Yeah. We'll tweet a link to that talk from the ScaleConf Twitter account. Sorry? We will tweet a link to the talk from the ScaleConf Twitter account. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Cool. Thanks a lot. Let's give him a clap.